Tango's book is entitled For Thy Truth's Sake, with the subtitle A Doctrinal History of the Protestant Reformed Churches. Professor Henkel, this book consists of as many as five parts, and the first part deals with the roots of the Protestant Reformed denomination, uh, its roots being in the Netherlands, and then through the CRC, and uh, your own your own family came to the States through the Netherlands, Professor. When was that? Uh, my father and mother were both born here, born in the States. Okay. But both of them had parents that were born in the Netherlands. And the same is true of my wife. Her parents were born in the States, but her grandparents were born in the Netherlands. So our connection to the Netherlands is two generations back. What denomination in the Netherlands? Um, my grandmother was, my paternal grandmother was Fries and was of the upscaling okay. of the uh, separation under de Kock. My grandfather was of the Herformdeker, the state church. And my general impression is, from all the things my father told me, that he was not even converted. And that he really was converted under Reverend Herman Hooksma's preaching in Easton Avenue. He was a member of church and he always went to church but uh, it didn't seem to mean anything to him until he was converted under Reverend Hooksma's preaching. And when the split came in 1924, he gave so much to the church that my grandmother finally had to say to him, you're not leaving me enough money even to buy groceries. So much he gave to the church. He was thoroughly and completely devoted to the church, although how much he understood of Protestant Reformed doctrine, of course. He was an older man by the time that came. On my mother's side, my grandmother came from Utrecht, a southern province, and I think my grandfather came from South Holland, South Holland, that province there. I, but I'm not sure about that. Huh. He was a turf skipper. You know what a turf skipper is? No. He sailed a boat in the canals selling peat. Okay. For uh, fires and so on. Oh, I didn't know much about turf in the Netherlands. Just like in Ireland. Yeah, yeah, I know about turf over here. Yeah. I didn't, didn't know there was much of that. Oh, yeah. yeah. And my my grand, maternal grandmother was uh, of the higher class. Mm. Her father was a writer, an author. And so she was of the higher class. So her family told her, if you married that guy, who's only a turf skipper, you're going to be disinherited. And she did, huh. and she was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So your roots are actually in various parts of the Netherlands, from yeah. Friesland in the north to Soot, South Holland in the south. Yeah, huh. yeah. My grand paternal grandfather was Hrargers. Plot Hrargers. Plot. That means the common coarse language of the lower class of people. And my paternal grandfather was plot. <laughs> he was. <laughs> so your ancestors are also mixed uh, socially and economically. Yeah. Yeah. So 
your ancestors and various others came to make up the PRC in the States in their generations? My mother's hmm. parents, um, I don't know about her mo uh, my mother's mother so much. I think she was probably in the, I'm not sure, I better not say, but my mother's father was in the mystical provinces in the south. And um, he was a member of the Hrithmer the, the what they call the Svartakhausen, the black stocking people. Okay. And he kept that mysticism all his life, too. Huh. He did. He used to tell me that the farther south you got in the Netherlands, the heavier was the soil and the heavier was the soul. And of course, Ceylon, which was full of mystics, was way in the south. <laughs> Well, one of the earliest uh, controversies in the ministry of Herman Huxema involved uh, Janssen. And your seventh chapter deals with Janssen's view of miracles and the Reformed and Protestant Reformed teaching regarding mir miracles. You, you wrote your master's thesis mm -hmm. on, 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 I did. on Janssen. Do yeah. you care to talk us through that a little? The Janssen controversy? Yeah. Well... There were many twists and turns in it, but all the professors in the seminary, in Calvin Seminary at that time, were children of the Afskani. Mm -hmm. Berkhoff and uh, Heinz, and I don't know about Voboda, whether he was of the Afskani or not, I'm not sure, but he was a kind of a figure on the periphery. Jansen was not. All the other professors were uh, upskating men with their views of immediate regeneration and uh, infralapsarianism and all the rest. Jansen was a Kuiper man, but he wasn't ever an ordained minister. Hmm. And that was a source of soreness, really, between the professors, too. But anyway, Jansen was, as far as I can tell, a brilliant man. And he had his education and his degrees from some of the most prestigious universities in Germany. And was considered very, very learned. And he was too. He was a very learned man. He was a member of Eastern Avenue. And Huxma was his minister. So he taught Old Testament, and in Old Testament, he taught the basic higher critical views of the German universities, and denied, and denied, reinterpreted the miracles, and well, for example, the uh, water that Moses brought forth out of the rock was not created by God and could not have been created by God because of the law of the conservation of matter and energy. So what happened there was that, and that was the miracle too, that all this water, to give enough water to three million people, plus who knows how many animals, for who knows how long a time, was in that rock. And that the miracle was that when Moses hit the rock, he hit a soft spot in the rock and broke through so that all that water came out. It must have been some size of a rock. <laughs> <laughs> a mountain. <laughs> that, was, that was one thing. Common denials of the miracles such as you hear today. An earthquake caused the water of the walls of Jericho to fall. But an earthquake created by the rhythmic march of the children of Israel who marched around the walls. You know all that stuff. It's been wearing heavy shoes. Yeah, <laughs> so, I don't know. 
And he also taught that the Song of Solomon was a pornographic love story. And he taught that Ecclesiastes was the autobiography of a pessimistic philosopher. And that sort of a thing. Yeah. So his views on scripture were called into question and the other professors protested that and the case went to synod, but the other professors had never gone to see him about it and never talked to him about it, didn't even have any concrete evidence about it, so synod decided in favor. They exonerated him. But the professors were not satisfied. And so Reverend Uxma, who was on the uh, theological school committee at that time apparently thought where there's smoke there's fire and he was a personal friend of, of Burkhoff for example Burkhoff married him mm -hmm. even so he investigated personally and he became convinced that Jansen was after all a higher critic but in the meantime the Theological School Committee appointed a committee to investigate Jansen. And Huxma was on that committee and Danoff was on that committee. And I can't recall right off who else. I think H.J. Kuyper may have been on that committee. Anyway, Huxma did all the work and Jansen wouldn't talk and he wouldn't give them anything. So they had to examine his teachings from the writings of the students and the student notes, which is dangerous business, of course. You're dealing with secondhand stuff. Mm -hmm. But there were so many places where the student notes agreed completely with what Jansen taught that they picked out those points of which they were sure and Jansen never questioned the veracity of the report either. He never did. He said it was church politically wrong. And he said his explanation of the miracles was uh, legitimate. But the committee reported in a lengthy report to Synod, and Synod condemned him. The interesting part of it was that Jansen had appealed to Kuyperian common grace in support of his views. Not to the well-meant offer, he was a Kuiper man, mm -hmm. but to Kuiper's common grace. And so that's why these higher critics were capable of understanding scripture and explaining it in a legitimate way. And that question of common grace was never faced by the committee because they knew that if they would tackle that, it would tear the church apart, because there was bitter conflict between the people in the Christian Reformed Church who belonged to the, the Cook movement and those who belonged to the Kuiper movement, and it almost split the church. I had a professor in Kelvin when I was going there and died in the old Kuiperian. And he was supposed to teach Dutch. We never learned any Dutch, but we sure learned a lot about that conflict in the church. Who, man, he could really, uh, he had a big mustache and it would bristle and vibrate when he started about that. But anyway, um, Huxma later wrote in the Standard Bear that he regretted that he had not insisted on treat, treating the question of common grace when that case was up because that was at the bottom of it. That was at the root. And so the church was full of, of uh, Jansen men. So after, after Jansen was condemned, they went out to get Huxma. And because he had made his views on common grace known in the banner, the church paper, they got him on common grace. And that's how the Common Grace case came to the Synod. And that's how 
the sin and adopted the three points of common grace. Point one, the common grace of the of the the cock branch in Numbers two and three, the common grace of Kaiser. So they healed the wound mm -hmm. that was in the church. At the same time, in both branches, there were strong, solid, reformed people. And Huxma's ouster and Huxma's subsequent theology appealed to both those of the Decot branch and of the Kuiper branch and brought them all together under the umbrella of the Reformed faith and said the issues that divided them, supra versus infralapsarianism, mediate versus in, immediate regeneration and the rest, was set aside in the interests of uniting on the basis of salvation by sovereign grace. And so the fruit of the three points was that the good ones, the solid men on both sides, came together under the leadership of Huxmo. How God worked a good purpose in what was really a very tragic event. My father talked to me often about how he could, uh, on Sunday nights, he would often take a walk around the Dutch neighborhood. And if it was a summer night and the people were on the front porch, he could hear them argue vehemently about super versus infralapsarianism. But they didn't split because they're, they were united on the basic issue of sovereign grace. So the Protestant Reformed churches then formed in response to the Synod of Kalamazoo in Michigan in 1924. God loves everybody. God wants to save everybody. This right. grace then makes people basically something less than totally depraved so that they can do good works that at least in some civil sense, and then it began to get a bit fuzzy, they can do things that, that, that please God. Yep. And that are even of such value that they will be found, said Kuiper, in the New Jerusalem. And that that was Psalm 72. The kings of the earth shall bring their treasures. That was the good works of the unregenerate. Prof, this book is a, is a fine work. Chapter 12 deals with the concept organic. I remember you teaching us in seminary that is a very important reformed concept. Could you briefly explain the concept of organic for us? You know, years ago, this was before the conference in Ashburnham, and that was what? 1996, 96, I think, before yeah. that. I was writing to a man in England about, I don't remember how our correspondence got started, but he was a dispensational Armenian Baptist to the marrow of his bones. And how he got started, I don't know. For a number of years, we corresponded about the question of baptism. Not so much dispensationalism, that would fall into place if baptism was once understood. How the New Testament and the Old, the New Dispensation and the Old Dispensation were not individual dispensations unrelated to each other. And we corresponded, for, oh, I don't know how many letters, I would say dozens, long letters. And he just couldn't see it. So finally, after a number of years, I introduced the organic concept into the idea of the covenant. And he rose up in holy horror. What are you talking about now? I don't understand a thing about that stuff. What do you mean? And I thought, how in the world am I going to explain this to him? 
So I said to him, I'll tell you what. You read the Minor Prophets especially, and every time you notice in the Minor Prophets that one verse will contain a pronouncement of terrible judgments against Israel, and the very next verse will contain beautiful and sweet promises to Israel. You explain that to me. I said, you can take all the time you want, but you read the prophets, note those places where that happens, and explain it, how God could say to the same people, you're a rebellious and unworthy people and you're going to be destroyed. I love you with an everlasting love. You tell me how that could be. And he was stuck, of course. He was stuck. And I didn't hear from him for a long time. And then he was at one of our conferences. And I came up to him and I said, how are you coming with the question about which we're corresponding? I don't want to talk about it. He says, why not? I think you're persuading me. He said, <laughs> today he's a fine outstanding reform man and he's right here at this conference <laughs> on the, the organic conception he finally saw what was the, the point of scripture and I think that's the key to covenant theology I really do I think that that's maybe the last fundamental idea that people understand, if they ever do, when they come into our churches from outside, especially from Baptist circles, they can't get that through their heads. That's a, almost a concept foreign. Danoff was the one who really brought that up into the agenda of the church. And Huxma picked up on that and developed it until young Carl von Ballen wrote, organic, 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 that's all you ever hear from those PRs is organic. <laughs> he didn't believe a word of it himself. And yet that's a key concept in scripture. I don't know how to explain it here in this interview in a simple way except that God always never deals with individuals as individuals. He doesn't. When he saves them or when he punishes them. But he always deals with people as part of families, as part of nations, as part of a race within the human race, and as part of the human race as a whole. And he judges them or saves them in connection with all these other relationships. That organic relationship means that in the broadest sense of the word, the whole human race is composed of a series of concentric circles. At the very center is Christ. The circle around Christ is in the old dispensation in Isaiah, the prophets. In the next circle around the prophets is the elect remnant in Israel. Around that circle is the reprobate element. And then around that there's the the Semite race, the, the descendants of Shem, and so on. God deals with everyone within that sphere. A man is judged on the basis of what family he's a part of, on the basis of the sins of his fathers that were visited upon the children, on the basis of his responsibilities within the family on the basis of his responsibilities in the church of which he was a part, in the nation. All those things play into God's judgment of that person. And the same thing is true with election. 
<clears throat> a corn plant is an organism. It's got roots, it's got a stalk, it's got leaves, it's got a tassel, it's got an ear, and the ear is composed of a cob and husks around it and kernels. What's the part that is saved? That little handful of kernels. That's all. That's all of a plant that stands 12, 14 feet high. Well, why the whole plant if all the kernels are only saved? Because the kernels need the plant. They'd never be there without the stalk and the roots and the tassel. That plant is an organism. And that plant is an organism like the human race in many respects. And the elect are the kernels. And the rest is there for the sake of the elect. And in the center of the elect is Christ himself. So that the judgment comes on the reprobate through Christ as well as salvation. Now has come the judgment of this world. Now is the prince of this world cast out. But God always deals with everyone in that organism of which he is a part. And so God saves believers and their seed. And that's why scripture talks about a vine and its branches and about an olive tree and about grafting into the old olive tree and the possibility of those branches being cut out. Other branches that grow out of the branch grafted in and so on. That's the organic idea. But I don't know if that's clear. Well, I understood it's clear, but I've had a few go does. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that's crucial for an understanding of God's covenant. Well, this book, as we said, takes the roots of the PRC from the Netherlands and in the Christian Reformed Church in North America, talks about the Common Grace controversy, which was the origin of the PRC. It's coming out of the CRC, deals with miracles, sovereign grace and revelation, the doctrine of scripture, the antithesis. There are chapters also on organic, as we just looked at, the development of sin. And then in part four, we have a whole section on the truth of God's covenant and a split within the PRC in 19, 1953. And there's so much we could deal with there that we'd probably better off not touch it. I agree. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it, we, 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 could, we, could, we could run over an hour on that one. Yep. So I'm going to ask simply this for my own benefit, and I hope some of the, some who watch are interested too. This book, the uh, appendices, the footnotes, even the illustrations and the lovely uh, helpful pictures, it must have taken quite a lot of work. Yeah, it did. I wrote a lot of the text. I had done a lot of the research, most of it, but I wrote a lot of the text in Anglesey. Oh. North Wales. Yes. Oh. And I sent it to uh, Chuck Terpstra and Don Duzema for their evaluation, and they sent it back. But probably half was written in North Wales. Huh. I didn't realize that. What, what did they think of it? Chuck and Don Duzema? Oh, they they liked it. it was great. Yeah, the book was written in connection with uh, 2000, the, 25th, uh, the 75th anniversary of the churches. Yeah. And what I was at pains to do in that book is not only trace the roots of the churches, but demonstrate how a firm commitment to the truth of sovereign and particular grace affected other points of doctrine. And that's why I have a chapter in there on Revelation and on miracles and a lengthy chapter on the covenant and so on because I wanted to demonstrate that once we shook loose from our churches, 
shook loose from the chains of common grace and began to develop sovereign and particular grace in different areas of doctrine. It made all the difference in the world as to the approach of those doctrines and the development of them. Huxman in his dogmatics has a unique explanation of miracles. I never saw it anywhere else. Same thing with Reve Revelation. Huxman did not believe in general revelation. And that was simply because everybody was talking about re common grace and general revelation. General revelation was common grace. Maslick wrote a book on it. And even even uh, uh, the Dutch theologians were teaching that. Um, Kuiper taught it, and um, come on, the, ma the name escapes me. Uh, the, the great theologian whose reformed dogmatics have just been translated, Bonnig, in his uh, reasonable faith. He taught that. General revelation is common grace. Hooksmith said, There is no common grace. What does that do about revelation? Well, what do you know? There is no such thing as general revelation. It's a hoax. Where in the Bible do you read general revelation? And so he, he developed doctrines in a unique way because of his commitment to sovereign and particular grace. That was my goal in that book. I don't know how well I succeeded, but look, PRs, you've got a heritage that is not just limited to a couple of doctrines over which there were controversies. But the application of those doctrines by our spiritual fathers was an application of doctrines that affected and influenced and altered in fundamental ways many, many doctrines in Scripture. And that that's why our heritage was rich and worth fighting for and worth knowing and worth teaching to our children. That was, in short, the goal of my book. I don't know what, if it succeeded, but that was it. Thank you, Professor Hank. Okay.